There is a new order that has been put out, not by the governor, but by the state of Alabama in general, by the ABC board. So the Alabama Beverage Control, that's the people that run liquor licenses, uh, your ABC stores. I know, I think it's super weird that Alabama actually owns liquor stores too. That's a very odd thing to me. I, I don't know why we're in the alcohol business, but we are for some reason. Uh, but the ABC board voted unanimously to cut off all on-premise alcohol sales by 11 p.m. with the understanding that they will be consumed by 11.30. So basically, if you are a bar or any place that serves alcohol in a public venue, by the way, as far as I understand it, I could be wrong here, but as far as I understand it or what I've read of the bill, this would apply to any venue in the state of Alabama that serves alcohol. Now, I used to be a bartender. I know that shocks people because I'm also a minister, but I mean, it wasn't like a, a full-time gig or anything, but you know, going through college, I, I was a bartender part-time at a hotel. And it's interesting because I'm like, well, would the hotel have to cut people off at 11 and, and then, uh, you know, stop at 1130? Because, you know, personally, our bar closed at, I think, 10, if I'm not, if I'm remembering that correctly, so it wouldn't have affected that particular hotel bar. But there are hotel bars that stay open significantly later than that. So even though the person is there in the hotel, would they have to cut it off? I didn't see an exemption for that, so I assume so. And what if you're at a restaurant that's, that's more like a restaurant and bar as opposed to a bar and restaurant? Because there's a lot of bars that also serve food, but there's also many more. I would say the vast majority of restaurants that happen to serve alcohol, uh, if they are one of those places that just stays open really late, Granted, I assume that those are, are far less common because usually if you're staying open past 11 p.m., that's usually a bar that has a restaurant in it as opposed to a restaurant that has a bar in it. Normally, those are primarily bars. But nonetheless, this is the way that they voted and, and you have to have the alcohol consumed by 11.30. This is a quote from ABC administrator Mac Gibson who said it was, quote, way t a way to mitigate the difference between a complete shutdown and, and uh, serving alcohol until 2 p.m. It won't make everybody happy because there are bars that depend on that late night trade, but, by, but a bar by definition is a congregation of people. So here's my question. Why mitigate it all? According to your statement, you're saying that it is very, very difficult for bars to maintain six feet difference. All right, well, I don't understand this. Because either, if that's the case, you're saying, well, we know that that risk is there and they probably can't really social distance, so we'll just let them do what they want. Or, okay, well, they can't social distance, ergo, we have to shut them down. Now, obviously, I'm not in favor of shutting them down. I want, them, I want the government to stay out of it. However, I at least understand the approach of, well, people are going to congregate there. And by definition, a bar is a congregation of people, and they can't really maintain six feet of distance, so we've got to shut them down. I don't agree with that approach. But honestly, that makes more sense to me than these goofy half measures. Like, shutting it down at 11 p.m.? Well, if it's a congregation of people and you're saying that they, they can't distance six feet, what difference does it make when they shut down? That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't see how that's doing anything to help stop the virus. And then Gibson also said, quote, ingestion of alcohol generally leads to higher levels of fat fraternization. Okay, well, that is true. I mean, it'd be impossible to argue against that. I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think Administrator Gibson is wrong. I mean, anybody that's ever been in a college town uh, and, and been in a college bar knows that uh, the more alcohol a person has in them, the more likely they are to, you know, go hit on members of the opposite sex or be super friendly with people, talk to people. There's some people that get very handsy, and I'm not even talking about it in a sexual way. Like, uh, I've had fraternity brothers that, like, there's nothing they want more than a hug once they've had a few in them. Like, that just happens. Uh, <laughs> one time at an Auburn game, I actually had a fraternity brother who, frankly, had been, uh, been pre-gaming pretty hard at this point. <laughs> Literally, and he's a big dude, uh, literally just pick me up in his arms when Auburn scored a touchdown that one time, which I was not expecting because, you know, I'm a big dude myself and, you know, 6'3 and, and weighing about 190, 180 pounds, something like that. He just swept me right off my feet and picked me up, which was uh, a little disconcerting. I'm not going to lie, but, you know, that plays at that point. He's not wrong about that. 
that alcohol does make people a little bit more apt to uh, not really regard. I mean, it, it inhibits your senses. It inhibits your judgment. It impairs your judgment. That's why we don't let people drive when they're drunk. And so, of course, people are going to necessarily be less cautious when they're consuming alcohol. So even if you're somebody that is real concerned about keeping a six-foot distance normally, once you've had a few in you, you're a little bit inebriated, you're probably not as concerned about that because you're less cautious. It, it drives back those inhibitions. Now, remember, I'm saying all this based on observation because I've actually never drank anything in my life. But nonetheless, you know, he's not wrong on that. But again, my question goes back to then why the half measure? If that is the case, do we think that people are not more likely to fraternize with one another when they've had a few in them before 11 p.m.? Because, granted, most of the action in Auburn when I was in college did take place after 11 p.m. I mean, most of us didn't go to bed till 2 or 3 in the morning. <laughs> That's just the way it was in a college town. Uh, but the thing that is baffling is, like, do they think that alcohol doesn't have that effect if they're drinking before 11? It, yeah. It, it really is strange. I don't see how this makes any sense whatsoever. If you're worried about alcohol having the effect on people, which, you know, I admit that it does, uh, being a little bit more friendly, being a little more apt to not social distance, then why are you allowing alcohol to be sold anywhere at any time? Why, why don't we just close down the ABC stores and close down everything and make sure that nobody has alcohol because, God forbid it, it might lead them to not social distance? Well, Okay, well, if that's the case, why are we serving alcohol in the first place? I don't understand this. Look, either the, the virus is going to be this catastrophic event or, or we need to start getting back to normal. Look, you can't control people. That's really what this all boils down to. There are going to be people that get drunk, and because they get drunk, make dumb decisions, don't social distance, do things that they wouldn't normally do. But the idea that cutting somebody off at 11 p.m., at least for on-site consumption, is somehow going to mitigate that is just childish and stupid. Like, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it at some point. They're either going to drink before 11 p.m., or they're going to purchase alcohol at a place where they can drink it afterward. And by that, I mean, you know, just go to the ABC store, buy it at, like, you know, 7 at night, and then, you know, have enough to last them until whenever they want to. If alcohol is a risk factor, then why are we allowing anyone to consume alcohol at this point? Now, I don't want them to stop people from drinking it. I'm saying that their own logic is inconsistent. Frankly, I don't care. I don't care whether this goes into effect. It doesn't affect my life in any way, at least in the sense that I don't drink. Ergo, I don't, and I haven't, you know, I don't really go out to restaurants very often either. Uh, now that the apocalypse is upon us. But my point in all of that is, if that is the logic, if, if we're saying that alcohol is a danger and people might get coronavirus because of this, then why are we consuming alcohol? I just don't understand it. E either, make up your minds here. Either alcohol is something that is, it makes you inherently more dangerous when it comes to coronavirus, or it doesn't. This will we'll serve it to a certain point, and then at a certain point in the night, we're not. It's just dumb. It's exactly the same thing. And here's the other argument, because at least with other measures, like with the mask mandate, for example, I don't agree with the mask mandate, and I don't agree with government forcing that on somebody, but at least it makes sense to me. At least I can understand, okay, I don't agree with the mask mandate, but at the same time, I can see how maybe theoretically, whether or not it actually works in practice or not remains to be seen, but at least theoretically, I can look at it and go, all right, well, I can see how that might stop the spread. But this doesn't. I don't see how this would stop the spread at all. In fact, if anything, it might make it worse. I made this exact same argument when Mayor Reed here in Montgomery put a curfew on the city. Anytime you compress the amount of time people can go to a certain point, and the vast majority of them, I mean, it might discourage a handful of them, from going there, but the vast majority of them are going to continue to go to that location, what is that going to do? It's going to mean there is a higher concentration of people in that location in the now limited time slot that they have. So if you have a, per if you have a group of, you know, 100 people that were going to go to one particular bar, and now that bar is not going to serve alcohol 
after 11 p.m., what are they going to do? They're going to all go at the same time before 11 p.m. This is an incredibly stupid thing to do because by the admission of the ABC administrator, Matt Gibson, that we just read, it's very hard for bars to maintain social distancing and people generally don't. Okay, I agree. I, I understand why that's a problem. What happens when all of them show up at the same time in a place that's hard to social distance? What do you think the result is going to be? Not only does this not help stop the spread of coronavirus, it actually facilitates it. I don't understand the sheer stupidity of some of the people in our state government. I, I don't understand, like, I'm just a radio guy. I don't understand how I can understand all of this and these people whose jobs it is to do these kinds of things they don't get it. Did, did they not think through that scenario? I, I'm just I'm completely at a loss. But I will say that the one good thing that has come out of this whole thing is uh, some of the memes have been pretty good. And I want to share with you right now my favorite one uh, featuring Shaquille O'Neal. So you see this. Uh, for those of you who can't see, it says COVID waiting <laughs> until 1 p.m. 11 p.m. to come out. And so you see Shaq hiding behind the tree. <laughs> I got to tell you, like some of the coronavirus memes have been really good, but it, it, it does illustrate the point. Like, do they think that the virus is somehow not going to come out, at, or, you know, before 11 p.m., that it's just going to hide out until 11 and then it's going to start circulating? No, this is absolute lunacy. It's a goofy meme, and I know that, but it actually does illustrate the point pretty darn well. The virus, you're no more susceptible to the virus after 11 than you are before 11. And so the half measure thing just doesn't make sense. It's just annoying to people is all it is. And furthermore, I have to say though, this has got to be the smartest virus. This has got to be, bar none, without exception, the smartest virus we have ever had to face. I mean, this thing knows the difference between a hardware store and a, like a local mom and pop clothing store. It knows if it's in Lowe's not to mess with you. But if you're in a mom and pop clothing store with less people, the virus can get you there for some reason. Uh, it knows the difference between, for example, a, a protest that's going on in support of Black Lives Matter and a protest that's going on in support of reopening. Those are very, very dangerous and should be stayed away from. But if you're if you're protesting in support of Black Lives Matter, then the virus knows, hey, I'm going to stand off. It's the first politically correct virus we've ever seen. This thing is incredibly intelligent. It also knows the difference between, for example, a big box store like a, a Walmart or something like that, and school or church. It knows in school and church the virus can get you, but it knows if you're in a Walmart, oh, it's got to leave you alone. It's got to leave you alone when there's a delivery person coming your way. Like, it, it just, somehow this virus knows all of these things. And uh, it, you know, also amazingly, it knows the difference, for example, in a funeral and a George Floyd funeral. Funerals, you no, know, if you've had a loved one or a, a close family friend that died, can't attend that, can't have a funeral, it's just too dangerous right now. But if it's a funeral for George Floyd, yeah, we can have several thousand people meet up and, and huddle together in a small room. And what, he's up to five or six funerals, I think, last time I checked, all over the country. If it's a George Floyd funeral, oh yeah, cram them in as tight as you can, as much as you can. Uh, but they're all wearing masks, so it's perfectly safe, but you can't have more than 10 people at a funeral for your grandmother that just passed away. <laughs> the mental gymnastics you have to do to arrive anywhere within the same universe of this line of thinking is ridiculous. This thing is basically the Sharknado of viruses. Like, you, if you've ever seen the movie Sharknado, and by the way, the movie knows it's ridiculous, they, it knows that it's stupid, it's playing up to that, it's basically a parody of itself, which is honestly kind of funny. Um, like, th at one point, there's like, th there's sharks in space, that doesn't even make sense, and they're like, we're just making this up as we go along. It's the same kind of thing, like, the coronavirus is the shark NATO of viruses, it does whatever it needs to do to make you comply with whatever you know, ridiculous thing that, that whoever, whatever government bureaucrat came up with that morning. The virus just molds and adjusts to whatever we need it to do now. And 
believe you me, if, if there is political hay to be made, that is going to be the number one deciding factor between whether or not the virus can do this or can't do that. It's so abundantly transparent. But the, the real question, because I, I think this kind of ties everything back together, why do people do this? Why is it that people in our government do things like the ABC board here that, that makes no sense in response to the virus? I think there's a couple of contributing factors to this. Chiefest among them, frankly, I think is they want to be able to say that they did something. And from a governmental standpoint, you kind of understand why. Because if something happens, you as a government official or a bureaucrat or, or whatever else, you want to be able to go to people and say, well, I did X, X, and X during this crisis, and that's why you should vote for me, or that's why you should want me to be in the position that I'm in. And by the way, businesses do have a vested interest in this as well. They have to say, well, we did X, X, and X, and that's going to keep the, uh, the lawyers off our backs. Same kind of thing. They have to say, well, we did all of these things, ergo you can't hold us legally responsible. Basically, it's the same argument, just manifested in a different way that both private businesses and, in this case, government influences, they're, what they're trying to do is keep people from being mad at them. And so they think that if they can do something, whether it helps or not, Mayor Reed's the perfect example of this with that idiotic curfew that he put into place. Well, at least I can say I did something. Did the something work? Well, not really. Did I think it was going to work? Not really. But at least I can say I did something. It's a panacea. Well, actually, that's not even the correct word. It's a, it's a placebo. It's basically something that I can say to people, I can say to people that support me to make them think that I actually did something worthwhile even though I didn't. That's how this works. And I think people like the ABC board are in a similar position. They're just trying to come up with a way to justify their phony baloney jobs. <laughs> It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them, I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter, and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.